because of your voice and because you know how to read so well, it makes me sound smarter in the process. It's, <laughs> okay, it's like so a two-way street, right? So, <laughs> you know, I listen to it, but damn, that's pretty good stuff. Who wrote that? Oh, yeah, it's his voice. I experience multiple dreams every night, each overlaid with another, and all occurring within a relatively tiny geometric space. My brain. Magically, Whenever I am in the ocean in my dreams, I can see for miles, to the distant islands or the setting sun. Sometimes I'm in India, and roaming through wide open fields filled with massive golden temples. Other times, I am book hunting in large bookstores, searching for an obscure tome. No matter what I dream, however, all of it is bonded within a simulation of my own making, even as I am quite unaware of the mechanics behind how it is done. David Christopher Lane, uh, welcome to YouTube. And before we talk about the book, let's find a, a, out a little bit about you. Where are you right now? I'm in Huntington Beach, Southern California. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of a surf community. Isn't that where surfing. the Beach Boys came from? Uh, no, they came from Torrance, which is only about 30 minutes away. Okay. It's 30 minutes, I would say, north of, of where I'm at. Yeah. So, and yeah, are you are you a surfer? Yeah, I've been surfing for 50 years. Right. And my wife surfs as well. So we're always like trying to figure out if the waves are good. It's going to be great tomorrow, by the way. Good surf. Okay. Okay. And is that where you grew up in Southern, Southern California? I grew up in San Fernando Valley. And the San Fernando Valley, where all the studios are, Warner Brothers, Disney, all those little studios. And we used to drive about 30, 40 minutes to go to the beach because we hated the valley because it was all smoggy back in the 60s and 70s, as you can imagine. And uh, so then I eventually moved to San Diego, Del Mar, to get my PhD and then moved to Huntington Beach about 20 years ago. And what was your PhD in? Sociology of knowledge. My study was on the North Indian religion, a religion called Radha Swami, right. and it's uh, succession disputes. You know, like whenever like the Pope dies, there's a the College of Cardinals get together and try to figure out who's going to be the next Pope. Well, with gurus in North India, they do the same thing, but they don't have a College of Cardinals. What they do is they have disputes. You know, is it I'm the right disciple versus this disciple? And so there's this uh, split off that happens after a guru dies. And my job, it sounds like really weird, but my job early on, I was a research assistant to Professor Jurgensmar at Berkeley to track down all these obscure gurus and yogi lineages when I was like 22 years old and compile it. And we compiled the genealogical tree for a book that was published by Princeton University Press in 1991 called Radha Swami Reality. So I became somewhat of an expert in some weird field. So I did my doctoral dissertation on the politics of guru succession. Wow. Wow. And you were raised as a Catholic, though, weren't you? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, everybody I know who's been raised Catholic, always, especially you go to Catholic school. I don't know if you were you raised Catholic. Probably not. Right. Uh, well, um, my 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 mother and my father were both raised as Catholic. But when they got married, I don't know what happened. They decided to become Protestant Church of England, as we call it here, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a big deal. Although we sang hymns and stuff at school, it wasn't it wasn't a big part of my growing up. Not like the kids who I knew who were Catholics, who went right. to a Catholic school and went to mass, right. and you know, yes. it's a whole different deal. But all of my family on my mother's side, my uncles, my aunties, my cousins, and on my father's side, my uncles, aunties, and cousins, which meant all the weddings I went to were Catholic services, and you know, there were, so I was I, I was in the environment of of, uh, of Catholic culture, but I was not raised as a Catholic. No, but that uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I went to Catholic elementary school. You know, you had to wear a uniform for eight years. Then I went to an all guy, you can imagine, Catholic high school, Notre Dame, which was a disaster disaster. And, and then I also taught actually at a Catholic high schools for like five years back in the seventies and eighties. And, but I was a little radical, somewhat her, you know, uh, heretic because I had different views and you can imagine. So how would you describe your faith now? 
You know, I was once asked by Dodie Bellamy. She's a f pretty well-known writer in San Francisco. She had interviewed me because I had exposed a religion called Ekankar back in the 70s and 80s. And she said, well, what do you believe? And I said, well, you know what? The older I get, the stupider I get. So I define myself as a agnostic, mystical materialist. And she goes, what the hell is that? I said, well, I'm just confused because sometimes I think this way and sometimes I think this way. And so generally speaking, I'm just stupid. That's kind of my, my, I'm 66 now. And so I think, you know, not that smart. It sounds so weird, you're, you're thinking you, you don't have the answer. I have no answer. I always think of Omar Khayyam's very famous little quatrain, you know, as rendered by Edward Fitzgerald. And he says, look, I've seen doctors and saints come through this door to discuss various ideas, but guess what? They come out the same door. That is, everybody comes out, not that, you know, you know, I mean, the old, you might be more articulate, but you're you know, like, what you don't know. I mean, I'm obviously more articulate than I was when I was four, but yeah. ultimately, I don't know. I mean, the universe is a big, huge mystery to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and this book, uh, tries to unravel some of that and we'll get to the book in a minute but I, I just what what is your actual job title now of your day job i'm a professor of philosophy and right. i've been a professor of philosophy for the last uh, 33 years i used to be a lecturer in religious studies at california state university long beach for a decade before that i taught at ucsd for five so yeah. i've been teaching for almost 50 years my wife also andrea is also a professor of philosophy, and she's the chairperson of the department. So, uh, and she's also my boss. So that's kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and you founded the journal Understanding Cults and Spiritual Movements. What's the difference between a cult and a church? Well, you know, quite frankly, it, there really isn't one. You're really talking about a time difference. For instance, like obviously, early Christianity. Jesus was alive when he, after he died. It was a small group of people, and I'm sure the Jewish authorities looked at this thing, kind of like you know, some kind of weird offshoot. Yeah. Later, as you know, it develops. Constantine converts in the 4th century. You get, you know, now what we have 2.7 billion Christians in the world. It's now established, right? But yeah. if you get another church, like, let's say, Joseph Smith's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons. Mormons, yeah. That was considered a cult. When it, now it's become somewhat established, right? It's become considered well it's a recognized religion so i think cult is merely a buzzword for anything that's new and different so we came up with that title back in the 80s brian walsh and i founded that journal to try to see if we can navigate to, to make a distinction between what religion would might be beneficial and what religion might be destructive a good example if your son or daughter came home and said look i want to join join jim jones and jonestown Okay. Yeah. Or I want to join the Dalai Lama. Yeah. Well, there's clearly a difference. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and both claim to be religious, but you'd rather have her go to the Dalai Lama. Yeah. It, it seems a lot less harmful. And, and as history would show, it really is a lot less harmful. Yeah, sure. um, right. But you've also been involved in, in, in lawsuits and, and death threats from people no, who are defending no, religions. Who were yeah, they yeah. and what was the issue? Well, what happened was I, when I was 20 years old, this show goes back a long time, back in 76 or 77, I wrote a term paper on a new religion called Ekankar. Ekankar, I wrote this term paper, it was about 120 pages, and like an idiot, I submitted it to Ekankar's organization to think, well, maybe you'd be interested in my findings. We found out the founder, Paul Twitchell, had plagiarized his writings. We found out he lied about his birth. He was claimed to be born in 1922. He was born in 1909. He claimed he had gone to India. He never did. He just lied about a lot of things, created a kind of a neo-mythology. Well, they tried to sue me for it at 20 years old. And it caused a huge stir. And then eventually a fundamentalist Christian group called the Spiritual Counterfeits Project published a, a magazine based on my term paper, submitted 40,000 copies of it worldwide. People got sued left and right. Thousands of people left Ekankar. And that was the beginning of it. And then eventually I did another critical expose of a guy named John Roger Hinkins. Now, you may know about this because of Ariana Huffington. Have you ever heard of the Huffington yeah, Post? Yeah, Huffington Post. Yeah. Well, Ariana Huffington was a follower of a guy named John Roger Hinkins. Well, John Roger Hinkins got mad at me because we did a critical expose about his background. 
And he personally, this is on record, robbed my house, made death threats, said he was going to kill my wife, do all sorts of interesting things. I was on TV, you know, it was all this cult stuff. Then just to add insult to injury, there's another one called the Sathya Sai Baba group. Maybe you've heard of Sathya Sai Baba. He's pretty famous in India. He's now dead. He's the guy with the huge afro, claims to produce miracles. Have you ever been to a hard rack cafe? The co-owner or the co-creator of it was a follower of Sai Baba. Well, Sai Baba turned out to be faking his miracles. And we have photographic evidence of it, right? He would produce something out of his hand or whatever. He was also a massive pedophile. And this all eventually came out. BBC actually did a thing called the Secret Swami on him. Well, I got death threats every day for a year. And so we had to contact the, you know, the FBI and all sorts of things. And so I, I'm in retirement. I'm not exposing anybody, but right. that's going to happen. And I didn't mean to expose. It wasn't like I went out there and said, oh, I'm going to go get this gold. It's just that people would come to me and say, look, I got this information. Maybe you should publish something. And then I end up being the, the messenger. And they'd rather kill the messenger than, than listen to the message. So you're leaving the Scientologists alone then? Well, that's interesting you say that. Because I was, I love London, by the way. I was at the London School of Economics to give a talk. This was in 1993. And it was about the emergence of new religions in Russia, because as you know, the Soviet Union had come apart in 89. And so all these new religions had been allowed to rush in. So I was given a talk. And again, like an idiot that I am, I had no idea that the president of Scientology was in the audience. So I started talking about how L. Ron Hubbard lied about his you know, physics degree. You know, he actually didn't pass physics. How he lied about this and that, all sorts of that. I just went off, you know, off script, started attacking Scientology. Oh. So he comes to me after the talk and he goes, hi, I'm whatever his name was. I'm the president of Scientology. And he said these famous words to me. You are on our list now. You're on our list. So that was the last of that one. So, so as far as you know, you're still on their list. So are you? Yeah, are oh, you, sure. I get stuff all the time. Wow. I think wow. we froze. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we are. We're taught that we have to be respectful to people's religious faith. Do we have to be respectful? Because if somebody's faith is harming a certain group of society, shouldn't we call that out? I think you're right. I think you're absolutely. Listen, if we can be critical about medicine, let's say, or we can be critical about politics, or and we can be analytical when we take a physics class, why is it that when it comes to religion, it's hands off? You yeah. know, why can't we just ask deep, skeptical, critical questions? I mean, look, I always make this argument. If something is true, let's just imagine something is true in the religion, then it's not going to disappear because some idiot teacher from Mount San Antonio College asked questions of it, right? I mean, if it's true, it's going to withstand scrutiny. You know, like with, you think of somebody like uh, Isaac Newton, he, he obviously writes that famous Principia Mathematica, and he talks about gravity. He's not going to get upset if somebody goes, well, I just don't believe your theory of gravity. I just don't believe it. <laughs> He would simply say, go ahead and test it. You know, drop an apple or drop some keys, right? So yeah. I think religion needs people to really be analytical. You don't have to be mean about it, but just ask the questions that anybody should ask. Yeah. For, for me, I always think there's, there's this thing of, uh, be, you know, we're supposed to be tolerant of people's faiths. And I, 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 if somebody wants to believe any nutty thing they want, if the Pastafarians want to believe there's a giant spaghetti monster and all, hey, cool, fine, as long as they're not harming anybody. But right. Right. I think we get, to a, we get to a tolerance paradox where if you are tolerant of somebody's religious views, but they believe in throwing gay people off buildings or burning and stoning adulterers or you know, or, you know, female genital mutilation or whatever it is, if it's harming uh, uh, people in society and lots of them, that tolerance is enabling them. And right. so I don't know where you go there. I don't know why we allow, you know, even things like arranged marriages and things like that. The, you know, there are these serious things going on that often will break the laws of, of lands that people are in, not, not their homeland, if, if that's the, the dominant religion there. I just think we're in, we are in danger of, of being overly tolerant to things that we shouldn't I, be tolerant. I, I, think 
I think you're absolutely right, on. I think you're right. I think that's the way we should be. And, and, and it, you know, the thing is, it's actually, it sounds really interesting, or I mean, uh, contradictory. It's a form of disrespect in a way, not to ask a deeper question, because that means we think you're so stupid or such, you're such a loony guy that we're not going to even broach the subject because we know you're going to get wig, wigged out. I mean, really, yeah. if you respect somebody's position, shouldn't you ask the hard questions? Yeah, and shouldn't they have answers to those questions well, if this is the business they're in? That's it. They don't have the answers, and that's what it is. Because they're that's fair questions. Is. They're not insulting that's questions. You're not insulting them as a person or or anything. You're just saying, well, I, I don't understand this. Please help me understand. That's all you're trying to do. Well, the yeah. good example of that is Satya Sai Baba could do all these little religious trinkets, and he could produce a thing called Vibhuti, which is like sacred ash. So I wrote a critical review to the president of the uh, Hislop, um, Jack Hislop was his name at the time. And I said, look, why can't he pull a Nissan Sentra out of his ear or create the biggest diamond and feed the poor people in South India? I mean, if he really is God, yeah. why is he producing like trinkets that you could get at the 99 cent store? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the, the real reason that, you know, what is the reason that Harry Potter wears glasses if he's a wizard? Why can't he fix his eyes? You know, it's, it, it, it must be, it must be one of those deals. It must be. Okay, enough of that. But but great to get the background on you and, and what makes you tick and the kind of the adventures you've had. Let's talk about the book, the projected multiverse: how virtual reality technology is a tool for understanding the mystery of consciousness. How does this all come about? Okay, good question. A little background. After I got my PhD 30 years ago, I became very interested in quantum theory, neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and the study of consciousness. My wife actually know or met Francis Crick, you know, the guy who co-discovered DNA. And she worked with a guy named B.S. Ramachandran, who's very famous for the phantom neurology at UCLA, which she also went undergraduate. So I got interested in this study. Well, it turned out that there's a group in India called the Dialbog Educational Institute. It's a pretty famous college in Agra, you know, where the Taj Mahal is located. And they had a conference on consciousness, and they asked me to be a speaker to it. This just recently, just a few days ago. So I wrote this booklet called The Projected Multiverse for that, for that conference. The real backdrop is that I'm highly interested in virtual reality, or VR. And this happened many, many years ago, back in the 90s. When I was teaching at the University of London, I got the chance to try VR in 1993. And I thought it sucked. I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever seen. I had this big freaking helmet. I go, this thing's horrible. The graphics were pretty bad back in the early 90s as well, yeah, though, to be fair. Yeah. It was in its infancy, yes. Yeah, it was the 90s. It just wasn't happening. So about, it must have been 2014 or 13, my kids are really into technology, okay? So they bring back this cardboard thing where you put your phone in it. It's the original like VR, you put your uh, smartphone, you put the cardboard up to your phone. Well, I was blown away. I thought, my God, this is the beginning of something. So my sons, Sean and Kelly and I became obsessed with virtual reality. So we went to the VR conferences that Facebook used to hold. Now they're called, it's called Meta. And we got the first, I was one of the first guys to ever get an Oculus Quest. There's rumor that I may have even taught Palmer Lucky, who created the Oculus Rift. I don't buy it. He was at Cal State Long Beach at the same time I was teaching there. I wouldn't have taken one of my classes. But the point is, is that, is that I was blown away by it. Okay, here's the punchline. The fact of the matter is that VR has gotten so good, it almost tricks you to think you're in reality. And that's kind of an interesting philosophical question. You know, Elon Musk, you know, the famous Tesla guy, SpaceX, he just thinks that he's convinced, I, I don't believe him, but that we're not in space reality. We're in some kind of virtual simulation. That this whole thing's a simulation. You know, the created by some, who knows what, some computer overlords that are playing video games on it. You go, well, yeah. In fact, you, you know, it's interesting, at the University of Oxford, there's a guy named Nick Bostrom, pretty famous professor of philosophy. He wrote a book called Superintelligence. And in that book, he indicates that the possibility that we're already in a simulation is fairly high. 
whether we buy it or not. But here's the interesting point. It's 2022. VR's gotten really good. Imagine how good it would be in a century. That is mm. so good you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between whether this is reality or not. And it's already getting there. I mean, sometimes I play, I'll be quite frank with you, I use VR every night. And I will never play miniature golf ever again. It's much <laughs> better than VR. I know that sounds silly, but that's true. Different example. You know, you watch TV, right? Now, how big is your TV screen? Let's just throw, throw me a number. Four, 40 inches, I think, yeah. There's a thing called big screen, an application on VR. You put the headset on, and you have a screen as big as a drive-in movie theater and as clear as going to the movies. I'm not making this up. So I'm thinking to myself, why, why even get a TV set? This is that good. It's right there, and it's a lot cheaper. That indicates or gives you a suggestion about where we're going. Okay, this all loops back to the question of consciousness. Think about it from this perspective. What is the best VR headset the universe has ever produced? It's your brain. Your brain is a VR headset. That is it. Think about it. Like, you have all this incoming data coming to us, right? Lights and sounds and smells. But you never see the light, the sound, and the smell as they are. They have to be transfigured by, the, you know, by your eyes, by your olfactory nerves, by your ears. And these chemical electrical signals go to the back part of your brain, the visual cortex. And all of a sudden, you reproduce, that is, you manufacture, or what I call render, whatever that incoming data is, in the back of your freaking head. Yeah. So what you're seeing right now is not outside in some technical sense. It's literally in your head. I'm not denying there's outer reality. I'm not doing a Shirley MacLaine here. <laughs> what I am suggesting is that this is a rendering machine. If it's a rendering machine, then it changes the way we look at reality. Because you and I, let's be honest, have never seen reality. All we've seen is how our brain renders it. Therefore, VR becomes a wonderful how our own brains do it. So I've made the parallel example. You want to understand consciousness? VR is a great tool. Wow. Right. Yeah. Now, well, I know because I've read the book, but I wanted you to, to explain it to anyone who hasn't read the book, who is thinking of getting the book, or even better for me, the audio book, um, just exactly how this the works. The audio is much better. And by the way, you have a wonderful voice. And I, I'm, I'm a great fan of audiobooks. I want to praise you for a second. We have done here at Mount San Antonio College uh, three, 280 audiobooks. We're very proud of that. Okay? And my brother and I have been listening to audiobooks for 30, 40 years. In the old days, it was, you remember, in the old days, it was like this cassette CD, yeah. and then it went to CDs, and now it's audible and things like that. Your voice is key. The voice of an audio book is probably more important than the book. Because <laughs> if you think about it, if the voice is good enough, you could read the white pages and I will listen to it. If the voice isn't very good, you're like, I don't know. You know, it's, it's on Origin of Species by Darwin. It's a great book, but I can't listen to this guy. So in praise of you, a great voice changes a book. And I personally thank audiobooks. Not only is the future, it's, it's the one place, as you know, that's moving up. That is more people are buying an audio book every year than they did before. But it's the one place where if I have a preference and I love books, I would rather have it as an audio book. Yeah, it is amazing how, how it's well. Thank you for thank you very much for that. But um, what I like about about did, what I like about doing your book is you made me sound really smart. <laughs> Because I'm saying all this stuff that <laughs> you've you written go. and you've spent there a lifetime go. getting to where you, you were when you wrote the book. And I'm just coming along in the last minute and just reading it, you know, as if it, as if I've uh, as if I know it. And I'm still but asking no, questions. But that's what's so good. That's what's so good about an audio book, though, because of your voice and because you know how to read so well. It makes me sound smarter in the process. It's, <laughs> okay, it's like so a we both street, right? So, you know, I listen to it, but damn. <laughs> That's pretty good stuff. Who wrote that? Oh, yeah, it's his voice. 
It is amazing just how fast it's taking off. And I do books uh, all the time from people who it's their first, it's writers and it's the, f they've, they've written lots of books and this is their first audio book. You know, this is, we're at the very beginning of this still. I was talking to my wife about this uh, this morning because there was a, there was a radio job advert came up. My background is radio. And, and Julie said, are you going to go for this? And I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I'm quite happy doing the books now. Because we, you know, it was it was in North Oxfordshire and we're just outside London. So I said, you know, I don't want to be going up there every day. And really, radio's in decline and audio books is in growth. I know which end I want to be on that spectrum. I want to be where the excitement is and, right. and where the thing is growing. And the people who I get to meet, you know, to meet someone like yourself and to get the, the chance to chat to someone like yourself about your work having got so inside your head with or you know when we did the book you know um yeah, right. it's, it's just so much fun it's just you know so much more fulfilling i find than than my previous life in radio even when i did talk shows for the bbc and i introduced interviewed some some interesting people but this getting really really deep into the work with uh, right. you know w w with the kind of thing so the, the 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 blurb for the audio book it says part of a presentation at the conference of scientific uh, of science and consciousness in India. That's the conference you were talking about a little bit earlier, is That's it? Right. That's the one that happened on January first. Now they're very interested in studying consciousness from a scientific perspective. Right. So they do you know fMRIs on people that meditate. And every year they have a conference. They also have a conference at the University of Arizona in Tucson, which is fairly famous. And so they've invited me, I think, three or four times to give talks on consciousness. Now, that's, what's interesting about this is that I have a more materialist approach. That is, I tend to think that if you want to understand the, you know, consciousness, you need to understand the brain. And so I take a, what we call – Patricia Churchill is a pretty famous philosopher at UCSD. She's now emeritus. She wrote a book in 1987 uh, through MIT Press called The Neurophilosophy. Her argument was, you want to do philosophy, study the brain. Otherwise, you're just, you know, philosophers on armchair speculating, doing whatever. Philosophy done well is science. Philosophy done poorly is, well, philosophy. And so I have this bias toward a scientific understanding. So I think that understanding the brain is the to understanding consciousness. And a lot of people don't. They think that consciousness and the brain, they kind of have a dualistic uh, Descartes idea, is like a soul versus the body. Yeah. And I tend to look, at, let's be real clear here. The brain is where consciousness resides. Understand how the brain works, you'll understand the mind. Therefore, VR, to go back to virtual reality, is a great computational model in which to understand how you and I can be deceived by perceptions or by by sounds so that was yeah funny. they, they yeah. tend not to like it i mean to be honest with you they don't really like my approach they don't no because they i i think you you'd be surprised there's so many people that do not want a physical explanation of consciousness they want it to be something kind of like a spirit or as one of your famous philosophers in, in, in uh, england the ghost in the machine. They, they kind of want to believe in some kind of vapor. And I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with thinking it's, it's, it's who we are? It's our body. It's our brain. Yeah. Yeah. And what about, say, the consciousness of animals? How would that differ to humans, do you think? You know, that's a really good question. In fact, my wife just gave a talk on this, and we believe really strongly that there's a continuum. As you know, a lot of people for a long time thought that animals didn't have consciousness or couldn't suffer or couldn't feel pain. Yeah. That's now considered absurd. Of course they can. Yeah. And anybody who has a pet knows that they can not only feel pain and suffer and misery, but you also know they have a semblance of consciousness. Yeah. Now, it's really interesting that you raise this because there's a very famous Nobel Prize winner. I am probably mispronounced his name, named Gerald Edelman. He's now dead, but he made a very good distinction. He says there's two forms of consciousness, primary and secondary, or what he called first nature and second nature. First nature is when you and I and animals and probably even insects and fishes and birds are in the present moment, like just right here, you know, that sense of sentience. He then said, and Mikio Kaku will say the same thing, he's a physicist in New York, 
the more feedback loops or the more complex your neural system gets, the more subjective awareness you have. So the argument's been made that human beings, because of the complexity of their brain, have a really rich interior subjective sense. So you and I have a thing called second nature. What does that mean? Well, I can think about the future and I can think about the past and I can ruminate about all different kinds of possibilities. Where animals in general, we got to be careful here, are more instinctual. That is, they're not sitting there, your dog is not sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know what, there's black holes? The universe is going to come to an end in about 20 billion years? Donald Trump might get reelected? No, <laughs> um, you know, these horrible thoughts, the last one probably the worst, what would happen, sorry, what would happen in this case is the dog and an animal doesn't have that. That's why animals generally are happier than we are, because we're all yeah. stuck in our head. Now, the evolutionary advantage, and I love Darwin, the evolutionary advantage to having what we have is that we have many more options when confronted with a tiger, a lion, and a bear. We could, the night before, you and I think about it, say, well, maybe I should do a trap, or maybe I should hide, or all sorts of things that an animal, as far as we can tell, has a much smaller Rolodex. That is a much smaller uh, series of options. It is so there, though, the- isn't it? Because if you leave a... If, you, if you're normally home at the same time every night and you have a dog and you don't come home at that same time, the dog does worry what's happened to you. Yes. Or yes. certainly yes. has a, you know, misses That's you. Right. So they That's must right. be, they must be, yes. they must be thinking of a negative thing that's happened yes. for them to be so upset. So, right. so I think and they I, do I, have it, maybe not as large as us, but I don't think you can discount it. I think they must have it. I, I think you're talking like a continuum. It's not like, you know, either or. You know, Descartes made the argument that animals are just like biological machines and that they didn't have any subjective internal awareness. And he's wrong. Yeah. And what you mentioned is really the way to look at it. It's a continuum of possibilities. So obviously, like a dolphin or maybe a great ape or a chimpanzee would have, you know, subjective awareness somewhat similar to our own map, maybe not as much. Yeah. And it just goes down the gradations. The problem is we just don't know how far down it goes. Like, I don't know if you saw that documentary about the octopus. Where the guy yes, uh, my, the, the my octopus, octopus teacher. Octopus. It's like, like the, you know. yes, yeah. it's unbelievable. It is. See, and, and you wouldn't have thought that 500 years ago. So yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the approach. I think. Well, one of the many reasons why I'm a vegan is because, you know, uh, to get milk, you have to do some pretty horrific things to a cow to get milk, including, you know, raping them and sticking an arm up their anus and, and all the rest of it. But when you see the films of the calf being taken away from the mother, the mother is pining their baby. So there's definitely something there that they understand that this is wrong and they ha- they yeah. feel for it. You know, they, they yeah. you know, for people to think that animals don't have those they don't have it to the same extent of us of, of, of you know cause and effect and and um imagining you know the worst and stuff and and working at what's going on but it's there can you, can you you're, you're a little bit shipped okay? ashore but it's settling I, down I've been now a vegetarian yeah. for 50 years. for how long did you say 50 so you've been a vegan and yeah 50 i turned ve- a vegetarian when i was 16 yeah when like it was really difficult to do and now i'm a vegan because my youngest my kids have been vegetarian since birth but yeah. my youngest kid kelly a few years ago several years ago came to me he goes papa you got to up your game I go, what do you mean he goes dude you got to be a vegan how can you be a freaking vegetarian do you know what they do to dairy cows i'm like ah I go, yeah i know it's damn it and i go i like my cheese pizza and he goes that was my last refuge and i gave it up immediately i said okay i'm vegan and we've yeah. been vegan for several years and it's really the only way to go. And it's easy now because everybody's like, have you noticed how many more vegan options there are? Oh, there's vegan Beyond cheese. Burgers. There's Beyond Burgers. You know, it's just yeah, just pies. It's, it's just great. It is. It's just great. Yeah. And when you see how good it can be, you realize, well, there isn't even any need for all this suffering. Because, you know, you, people who think, oh, people got to eat and all that. Well, they don't have to eat that. They really don't. Exactly. And if we've got this a conscious once we understand when you know better you do better when you didn't know i mean i used to think cows gave milk i didn't realize what went 
you know, as a kid, when you're told that milk is good for you and cows give milk and there's little plastic farm animals in the school and everything. And, you know, it's just this massive indoctrination when you actually start asking questions, which is what we were talking about earlier with religion. And it's a lot of the same kind of thing is, is yeah. once you start questioning, you know, you need to question things. Uh, and this is where you've got to with the, with the projected multiverse is you've started How asking questions. Long? Right, right. How long have you been a vegan? Only a couple of years. My wife's been vegetarian for a long time and I, I moved, we, we were living in Australia and we moved back to Britain in 97 at the height of the mad cow thing. And so I didn't trust the beef here. So I gave up right. beef. And then after, a, I think it was about a year, I, I gave up uh, pork and then lamb and then I was just eating birds. And then I was just eating fish for a while until I realized how horrific the fishing industry is. <laughs> uh, and just, just everywhere I turned and it was like, well, well I need to go full vegan because Julie had already gone vegan about six months before me she'd gone full that way so it was a gradual thing for me but as yeah. i found out more and more it was like the more it just didn't my actions didn't match what my uh morals were were about they, they, they were they were out of sync and then I, I can't if i'm against cruelty i can't do this you know it, it's you know you ask people people say they're animal lovers but a lot of people who are animal lovers are only pet lovers <laughs> right, right. No, when you know they reckon a pig is smarter than a dog but you don't have a pet pig so you don't get to know them yeah that's really good to hear i really like that yeah all right well the book is called the projected multiverse and it shows how virtual reality technology is a tool for understanding the mystery of consciousness it's still a mystery but it is it is this is a great tool to understand so much more about it and what is going on it's a fabulous book and i really enjoyed doing it and so thank you very much for choosing me as the narrator for the book david it was oh, just great best. we had a lot of we had a lot of auditions and yours stood out as the best by far Fantastic. Thank you so much. What's next for you? What's next for David Christopher Lane? Well, right now, I have a contract with Cambridge University Press on the, um, in fact, I just got my reviews back. You know how it goes through a refereed process and the referees like the book. I have to make some changes. It's about the history. You might find this interesting. It's, it's about the history of Shabbat Yoga. Shabbat yoga is this idea that you can listen to internal sounds by meditating and causes your body to kind of go numb and kind of reproduce a near-death experience where you feel like you're having an out-of-body experience by listening to subtler and subtler sounds. I know it sounds really kind of strange, but there's a whole history of it that goes all the way back to the Vedas. There are Christians who have done it. There are Muslims who have done it. Hindus have done it. So the book I've done for Cambridge is a historical overview of this practice of listening to internal sounds. And so it's it become a very popular yoga. I think there's probably 10 million people in the world who practice it. Uh, and what are these internal sounds? What, like well, heartbeat or breathing? It, no, 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 no. What it's, No, it's not like tinnitus. What, is, what it is, is, the very first sound that you'll hear is like the tinkling or the rushing of a wind. Like if you close plug your ears, is what they do with the technique. You'll start to hear something of the bell sound. Your body will start to have a kind of numbness that happens where you get kind of like, oh, my God, something's happening. And all of a sudden, if you listen to the subtler and subtler sound, at least this is what the yogis believe, you, you will leave your body. You'll have this experience. Now, it could be a virtual simulation, but you're going out of your body and you follow these subtle sounds. You'll see lights and have all sorts of mystical experiences. The interesting thing is that this practice has been, it's transcultural. That is, you'll find it among the Sufis, you'll find it among the Hindus, sometimes among the Buddhists, the Jains, the Sikhs definitely have it. And, uh, and so all these new religions have also have it as well. So that was kind of my historical survey for Cambridge. And I'm just tidying that up. Then after that, just one last thing, Professor Jurgensmeyer and I are going to do a new edition of Radhaswami Reality, which we did for Princeton University Press. We, he's now got a contract with Oxford uh, University Press in India because they want to come up with a, a new edition. So that's the, the next. Wow. Well, it goes on. It goes on and on and on. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper. 
and uh, yeah. fascinating stuff. Great to talk to you. The Projected Universe, it's it's a book, it's an e-book. It's also now an audio book. And if you'd like to get the audio book with a trial with Audible, if, you go in the, if you're watching this on YouTube and you go to the blurb down below, there's the link there where you can get a 30-day trial with Audible, which means you get the book for free. So uh, check that out. Click on that. And uh, yeah, have you got a website if people want to know a bit more about you? Yeah, I, 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 in fact, you'll like this. Back in the 90s, uh, we had one of the first websites ever created in the world, the first 500. It's called Neural what? Surfer. Yeah, it's, it, I was on the internet back in the 80s. Nobody believes it, but we were. And uh, what? 80s? You know, email, <laughs> Ooh, what's that? Um, we created a website called the Neural Surfer. Now, neural, like brain, surfer, because I surf. So it's neuralsurfer.com. Right. So if you go to neuralsurfer.com, You'll see all that stuff, all my writings and movies and silly stuff. Brilliant. David Christopher Lane, thank you once again. Thanks for coming on. And don't forget, if you want to get the uh, the Projected Universe, then go down to the, the blurb in YouTube and all the links are there, everything you need. I'll even put the, the Neural Surfer link down there when I, uh, when I put that up. So uh, that'll be there as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now.